We turn now to the music of the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Uh, as I think I said a couple of weeks ago, here are two bands that not only share the same listeners in many cases, but they share the same label, uh, Capitol Records in Los Angeles, at least in the United States. Now, the Beatles were signed to EMI, and that was the, uh, the uh, important signing for them uh, in the UK. But in this country, they were uh, on the same label with uh, the Beach Boys, Capitol, out of Los Angeles. So they not only shared common listeners, they not only shared a common label, but they also shared a lot of other characteristics uh, that are maybe sometimes overlooked as they begin to sort of push the boundaries of what it means to be a musician with artistic ambition for their music. Now we talked a, a bit about this when we talked about the Beatles earlier and we talked about the Beach Boys earlier, so we're going to sort of continue that story for a minute as a way of setting the scene for the psychedelic musicians that come after them. Uh, both of these bands explored new possibilities and enjoyed freedom in the studio because of their success. Because their records had been successful, they were able to do things in the studio environment, which was in those days a very expensive environment to be in. Record companies weren't interested in giving just any group opportunity to spend hours, days, weeks in the recording studio. It had to be clear there was going to be some financial return. And with the Beatles and the Beach Boys it was. They used their success to continue to push the envelopes and experiment. They both used the recording studio as a kind of compositional tool, as a way of uh, expand the possibilities of what could be done in the recording studio and search for new, stands, uh, new sounds. And both of them use classical features uh, in their music, drawn both from the 19th century tradition and from avant-garde. So in this case we can talk about the use of strings, orchestral instruments generally, uh, tape editing, uh, tape loops, these kinds of things you find, um, you find uh, throughout the music of the Beatles and the Beach Boys to some extent uh, with both groups. Um, we turn now to the music of uh, the Beach Boys and how it became increasingly ambitious from about the mid-1960s uh, through 1967 or so. Uh, we need to remember that Brian Wilson is now at this point but after about 19, well certainly by early 1965, in the studio full time. He's no longer touring with the group as they tour because he's had a problem being able to get onto an airplane. So he stays home and works on the music of the other guys go out and tour it. And so he's got the luxury of being able to sit in the studio, he's, they've sold a lot of records, he can book studio time without any problem, sit there and experiment with things. He's using some of the best session musicians in LA, a group called the Wrecking Crew, well a group, a, sort of a, a bunch of musicians, not just one band. There were, there were uh, probably a dozen that were involved in the Wrecking Crew, but they're the top studio musicians, and they're coming in, and he's working on all kinds. I mean, the, there is a um, there is a box set for Pet Sounds that you can get. That's four CDs worth of uh, of stuff to make up one album that maybe lasts maybe 35 minutes, top to bottom. Uh, and and that's even that's just a selection of the tapes that were there. I mean, the guy did a lot of recording. He did a lot of experimenting. Um, Probably the first sign we see of that is his, is his track, California Girls, uh, which we talked about earlier. Uh, but the big album that sort of is the arrival of the Beach Boys, uh, um, sort of more experimental artistic approach, is Pet Sounds from uh, mid-1966. That album is influenced by Rubber Soul, the Beatles had released in late 1965. Probably the two tracks on Pet Sounds you really want to check out to get the idea of the, the Beach Boys as, at their most ambitious is a track called Wouldn't It Be Nice, and most especially a track called God Only Knows. They then went on to do Good Vibrations in late 1966, which was released after the Beatles album Revolver, which had been released in August of 19. 66. Good Vibrations is a track where you can clearly hear Brian Wilson setting the different sections up um, and sort of editing them together to create this kind of composite, uh, very, very kind of trippy uh, kind of piece. We're talking about late 1966 now, and what Brian had intended to do was to release an album called Smile. It was even advertised for release in early 1967, but didn't seem to be able to pull it all together. Too much music going on, maybe too much acid, uh, whatever, in the studio, and so that that fell apart. Uh, in the meantime, the Beatles in early 1967 released Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields as a double-sided single. Uh, so the, sm the Smile Project falls apart and the, 
the Beach Boys instead released an album called Smiley Smile in August 1967, which was released after Sgt. Pepper, which had been released in June of 1967. So by comparing the releases of these two groups, you can see that they get increasingly ambitious. Uh, Brian Wilson, I guess, kind of loses in the, the, the ambition sweepstakes because he isn't able to bring Smile out, although it's been re-recorded in recent years. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's a fantastic record on its, of its own merits. Had it been released, I think it would have had a tremendous amount of uh, uh, influence, but it wasn't. Um, you can see the kind of back and forth between the two groups, a friendly kind of competition, maybe friendlier from the Beatles side than from Brian Wilson's side. I don't know for sure. Uh, let's turn now to the, the, the Beatles themselves and what they were doing. Of course, Revolver is usually seen of, as sort of the, the album that really introduces at least some element of psychedelia to the Beatles music, released in August of 1966, primarily because of the last track on that album, Tomorrow Never Knows, which is certainly the most avant-garde, experimental, ambitious piece the Beatles had uh, released uh, up to that time. Uh, we talked a bit about that a couple of weeks ago. As I said before, they followed with Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. They, those two tracks were originally going to be part of a concept album. When they decided to stop touring in, 19, in August of 1966, they decided they would, do an, they would just be a studio band. This new album was going to be written purposely to be not that they would never have to worry about performing it. So they were going to try to do all kinds of things in the studio that they never had to worry about doing uh, live. The first two tracks, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, were going to be on that concept album, which was going to be all about growing up in Liverpool. Uh, but because they had used those two tracks, they didn't want to use them on the album that followed. So this concept, the concept of the album became Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The Beatles would actually be Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They would come out, they would say we're Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And the tunes would go one into each other. And as you notice at the beginning of the album, you get Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and they say, and now here's Billy Shears, of course is Ringo, who comes on to sing with a little help from my friends. But after they get to the second tune, they kind of drop that format and just do tunes until they get to the very end. There's a reprise of the Sgt. Pepper music, and then they go into A Day, at the Li a day in the Life at the end of, this, uh, the, end of the second side. But because of the packaging, which participated in this Sgt. Pepper idea. There was a gatefold cover that opened out like this, that had a picture of the Beatles. When you, when you, brought, when you pulled the record out, it had a sleeve that had uh, a little sort of cardboard mustache and a little sort of cardboard patch you could put on. It really participated a whole lot. And the back cover had the lyrics, all of the lyrics written out. Now, as surprising as it may seem today, this is the first big pop album that actually had the lyrics written on the back of the cover, like you could read them without listening to the music, right? Of all those Dylan albums that we've talked about, the importance of Dylan as a lyricist, the lyrics were never written out on those albums, right? So here is already a kind of a, a, a step forward, a sort of putting into greater relief uh, the context of the lyrics themselves. Uh, the album itself is often viewed as the first concept album. Even if it were a concept album, if that, even if that question, there was not a question about that, it probably still wouldn't be the first concept album. This, uh, this idea can be traced back, even back before rock and roll, back to uh, people like Frank Sinatra, maybe. John Coltrane uh, in jazz. But nevertheless, it was thought of as the first concept album because of the Sgt. Pepper idea. John Lennon always said, my songs could have appeared on any Beatles record. I don't know what the Sgt. Pepper idea is. My songs didn't have anything to do with it. It doesn't really matter what John said. What matters is what people thought it was because bands started imitating what they thought Sgt. Pepper was. They started imitating the concept album idea. And that's what made the album so influential. If you're looking for the, 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 the tracks that are perhaps the most ambitious, musically speaking, uh, certainly a track like Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite is one because of the sort of use of tape loops uh, that occurs there. But A Day in the Life, the one that follows it, uh, is a fantastic, uh, most, the sort of most epic five minutes of music a lot of people have said. Uh, in the in the rock catalog, um, you know, they, there's a, a, a two, two transitions with, that are done totally by chance, where the orchestra players are just playing any instrument and any note on the instrument. They just have to come together at a particular time at the end of that. These big sort of crescendos. I'm sure if you've listened to the track, you know what I mean. Um, and and the, the the whole thing of piecing together a John song at the beginning, a Paul song in the middle, and returning to a John song, putting together fragments, doing this this uh, chance sort of orchestral build up crescendo. All all of these kinds of things make that, that, that track the most ambitious uh, one that they had done to date and really sort of set a model, raised the bar for all those musicians that would follow and many of them began to uh, uh, 
imitate them. They tried to continue this idea with Magical Mystery Tour, which was released in uh, late 1967, Dece December of 1967, and they also did their own movie to go with it. But the movie flopped, and most people didn't think the movie was very good. They loved to see the Beatles, they loved to see the music, hear the music, but uh, the movie was not very good. Uh, and now the, now the journalists finally could say, the Beatles have finally done something that's flopped, now they're done for. Of course, they weren't done for, we know the story. But they even here at this late date, into 1967, into 1968, they still wanted to, to write the story that said the Beatles were all done, they'd finally flopped. Um, uh, I Am the uh, Magical Mystery Tour does c contain the vid video for I Am the Walrus, and Paul McCartney has said a number of times he defends it on the, uh, on the value of that. Um, also in 1967, in, or in August of 1967, uh, their long-time manager, or the manager since 1962 anyway, Brian Epstein, dies uh, apparently of a drug overdose. Uh, and so the Beatles are left without a manager at about the same time as they're getting involved with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in Transcendental Meditation. Uh, and so um, the, the, in this, I think we can read two things about the Beatles' career. One is that they've now got some management issues they're going to have to deal with, and it takes them a while to sort of get that together, and they lose a lot of money in the process. But also this turn toward the east. We already heard the sitar in, um, in Norwegian wood going back to Rubber Soul, uh, and John, uh, George Harrison's uh, interest in Eastern music generally, uh, within you, without you, on Sgt. Pepper. Now this East meets West thing that the Beatles sort of enact by getting involved with Transcendental Meditation, going to India to visit with, the, to, to study meditation with the Maharishi, really sort of put it into the mainstream. Remember, we're talking about the Beach Boys and the Beatles, we're talking about the mainstream artists, not the psychedelic underground. So by the time we get to the summer of 67, this East meets West thing, India as the source of wisdom and, and, and a kind of alternate spirituality really starts to come together. Of course, the Beatles, after all of this sort of psychedelic stuff, take a real uh, trip, uh, sort of step in reverse. The White Album from November of 1968 is really more of a songwriter's collective. Um, they begin to sort of look back to their roots more and more. The most ambitious piece on the White Album is a tape piece by John Lennon called Revolution No. 9, which probably has the distinction of being the most widely heard electronic music piece in the history of music, although many people probably only heard it once and maybe didn't even let it play to the very end. Nevertheless, it exposed a lot of people to the idea of what electronic music uh, could be. The Get Back Project, which ended up being the album Let It Be, uh, followed in January of 1969. Again, getting back to their roots. And then finally, the last album the Beatles released in September of 1969, Abbey Road. Um, and probably the most ambitious things that sort of fit with our psychedelic idea here are at the end of side one, I Want You, She's So Heavy, which ends with a big crescendo of noise and a looping of guitar chords and then a concert, then a a, 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 a very sudden stop. Uh, and then the side two, where Paul has put together many, many fragments to create this sort of suite, which kind of creates an extended piece. So now having seen what the Beatles and the Beach Boys are doing to kind of bring some of this ambitious stuff into the mainstream, uh, let's turn to the psychedelic subculture in San Francisco to hate Ashbury and see what was happening during just at the same time, but sort of off the radar developing out in San Francisco. <laughs> 